Regarding the hells, mm -hmm. I'm not finding it easy to think of the existence of them without an evil being. Right. From the Bible in Genesis 1, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. We know that God created the heavens and the earth and he saw that it was good. Mm. In 1 John chapter 1, 5 and 6, which says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So from this we know that God is love and would not create or exist in darkness. So I feel God would not have created hell and according to you, Satan could not have masterminded hell. Mm -hmm since he supposedly doesn't exist. Exactly. The people themselves would not be capable of doing it mm -hmm. and or would not be motivated to want to for obvious reasons. <laughs> I can't agree with that, but we'll see what I mean by that. <laughs> but they could not want to live there mm -hmm. because they could not want to live there. So who or what sustains the hells or these hells? I get that the condition of the people caused them to be there but something has to be holding it together. Right. Well, that's a fairly long-winded question. <laughs> it's an in-depth question, yes. A few paragraphs. Yeah. But uh, I understand the background. Uh, the person basically feels that there's got to be uh, Satan the devil because there's no way for the hells to exist without there being one. That's basically the underlying concept. And they're basing this concept upon the Bible being God's word, of course, again. Um, now... There's probably quite a lot of points that I'd like to make, you know, about this subject that the person has raised. If we look at all the things the person has raised, there's quite a lot of issues and assumptions that they've made that I cannot agree with all the way through their question. Okay. And this is the problem with many questions, is the question, them, the question itself often contains so much error that the presumption of the final question would never be arrived at if there was a knowledge of the truth in the other parts of the question. So, so perhaps we should just start at the so, beginning so of the question. So we need to start at the beginning and, and work our way through. Yeah. Now, they make a statement through this question. They say um, somewhere, from the Bible we know the truth that, and then off they go. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is, we cannot state that just because the Bible says something, we know. We only know through personal experience. The only way that I could teach the truth in the first century, bearing in mind that I didn't have a Bible to work from, I didn't have the Torah never told me the things that I told people, the prophets never told me the things that I told people. So how did I know? I knew by developing a relationship with God and going through this personal experience with God, so much so that God could write the word of truth on my heart mm -hmm. and I experienced this truth, then I knew. That is the only way you know. You are never going to know no matter what a book tells you. Even if the book tells you the truth, you're still not going to know mm -hmm. until you've gone through the personal experience of knowing. So you cannot make a statement, from the Bible we know. You don't know it from the Bible whatsoever. Even if what the Bible says is true, you still don't know it until it's been a personal experience of your own. Mm -hmm. Now, for most people, part of this question, the hells have never been a personal experience of their own. They've never been there. They've never visited there. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they look like. They don't know what they're like at all. So how can they say they know anything? Mm. They've never personally experienced it. Now, in the spirit world, there's whole groups of spirits who have visited the hells. They know exactly what they like. They know exactly what they feel like. They, they look like, how they smell, how they, how they taste even, everything. They know exactly everything about these hells. But no person on earth who's in their first incarnation knows such a thing. And that applies to everyone on earth aside from 14 people that I know. Mm -hmm. 13 now. Yeah. So, so the, the reality is that no person on earth can really state that they know from the Bible what the hells are going to be like. Okay. Until they personally have a look at them, they, they are not going to be able to even imagine them. Mm -hmm. right? Now, we might be able to assist them, those of us who have visited those hells, might be able to assist them to have some concept of, of what they would be like, but it's not until they actually go there that they'll actually know. It's okay. not until their personal experience. Okay. Mm.
So that's the first thing I'd like to say. Yeah. The second thing uh, that the person brings up is in the Bible in Genesis 1, uh, which says that God saw that he had all that he had made and it was very good. Now, I agree with that Bible statement. Also in 1 John 1, 5 and 6, that God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. I agree completely with that statement. Mm-hmm. The Bible itself disagrees with it, saying that God is a God of wrath at the same time, yeah. which to me would be darkness. But, uh, you know... Those two statements from the Bible, I agree with completely. Mm -hmm. Therefore, while it was possible to create a perfect creature that falls due to its own choices, it is impossible for God to create a creature that could fall and never be redeemed. Why? Well, for Satan, a creature that cannot be redeemed to exist... God could not be perfect. God in perfection has created everything in perfection. This means that God has created a system where anything that falls can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. That it cannot permanently fall and never be redeemed. Now, most Christians have never considered this. They believe that God somehow, even though perfect, can create a creature that would fall and then never be able to be redeemed. And this is a physical impossibility. If God is perfect, that cannot happen. Mm -hmm. If that can happen, then God is not perfect. So there is some kind of misinterpretation here and and some kind of lack of logic here in the Christian faith. The reality is God cannot create anything other than a perfect system. If the system is perfect and a creature falls from grace, as the saying goes, then that same creature has the ability to return from the fall. Mm -hmm. This is what I was pointing out with the illustration of the prodigal son that is recorded in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Every creature that God has ever created has the ability to return to grace, has the ability to return from a fall. That's how perfect God's system is. It enables every single person who's ever sinned, who's ever committed badness, who's ever done wrong, to return from wrong. Mm -hmm. That's how it's corrective in nature. And so this is really, in this point, you're pointing out why Satan cannot exist, exactly. basically. This Satan is... cannot exist because God has made everything perfect. Yep. And because God has made everything perfect, God cannot create a creature that through its own will can, be, can, can fall and never be redeemed. Mm-hmm. God, God can't create such a system. And if you think that God can, then you believe in an imperfect God. Therefore, he's not God. <laughs> so so yeah, the logic or the lack of logic in such an assumption is very plain. For Satan to exist, God cannot exist. Mm. So, if, if God does exist, then Satan cannot. Gotcha. And, of course, no spirit has ever seen a Satan, and so they know that Satan does not exist. <laughs> yeah. So then if we get to this person, in essence, this person is asking the question, really, if God made everything good, Mm -hmm. what maintains the darkness? Of course, yeah. And there's a lot of answers that we can give about that. So let's, but let's look at this assumption too. It says, uh, there's this assumption in Christianity that humanity is a flawed creation. Mm. Very much so, isn't it? Now, that cannot be true if God is perfect. A perfect God cannot make a flawed creation. Mm. So if we believe the scripture in Genesis 1 that God said everything was good and perfect, and in John 1, 5 and 6 that there is no darkness in God and there's only perfection in God, then we must also believe that humanity is not a flawed creation. Mm -hmm. We must assume that humanity is a creation that was exactly created as it was intended by God. So, so humanity, the way I see humanity, is that humanity is the pinnacle of God's creation, the pinnacle of expression of God's love, and is completely able to have free feeling and thought and then act upon the free feeling and thought, even if the action is out of harmony with God's laws and God's love. God gave this gift to humanity so that we would not be robots and that we would actually be free-thinking, sentient, I think they call them, beings. Beings that are able to make their own choices, whether those choices be good or bad. 
And yet, as you say... And that's not a flaw. <laughs> well, most Christians... Believe it is a flaw. ...believe that inherently we always make flawed choices. We no, have we don't. this choice and we always choose bad things, don't they? No, we don't. Do we? That's well, what no, they believe. I, that's but, what they believe, But the though. majority of people on the planet, through the course of a day, can make many good choices. Not every choice is flawed. Mm-hmm. They do make flawed choices or bad choices too. But that is a cho- based around their own will, their own desire, their own passion. It's not based around any flaw that God created. God created this beautiful gift, which we call free will, which is like a knife. Right? It, it, it has a very, very good function, <laughs> but only if we use it wisely. You know, if we use a knife unwisely, you can cause a lot of damage to the human body and other things. Yeah. So it's the same kind of principle. And really you're saying that the design, so God's design in us, is not flawed in any way because we have the capacity to use our will perfectly. Yes, we have the capacity to use our will perfectly in a good direction and also very badly, in a, uh, perfectly in a bad direction. But, but it's the usage of the will that is the important thing. God, gave, God designed it as a design feature <laughs> in the human soul, yep. not as a flaw of the human soul. Yeah. So, so instead of coming from this question from the point of view of, oh, we're all flawed and, you know, we're all going to end up with some, you know, we've got to be careful because we're all flawed and all those kind of things. That is, none of this is true. God designed the human soul as the pinnacle of God's creation. He gave the human soul the only gift that he never gave any of the other beings, and that is free will, the ability mm-hmm. to make choices for itself. Mm-hmm. And the way the soul exercises these choices is completely dependent upon their own will, mm-hmm. like they're allowed to exercise their choice in any direction. But that doesn't mean that God created the possibility of anarchy in his universe. He gave your soul the ability to make a free will choice, but he created a universe that is unable to enter anarchy. So what he did is he created a structure in which your soul would live. And if your choice disagreed with the structure, you would feel the results of the disagreement. A feedback system, if you Mm -hmm. will, that you're out of harmony with the rest of the universe. You're allowed to be out of harmony with the rest of the universe because God gave you free will. It's not very wise, of course. If you're out of harmony with the rest of the universe, you're going to experience a lot of pain at some point in your future. But it's the thing that God designed you to have the capacity to do if you desired. Mm -hmm. And this is a gift. It's not a flaw. Hmm. So this underlying Christian concept that it was a flaw, you know, that we, our heart is treacherous and who can know it? We're bad from the moment we're born to the moment we die and, you know, we've been bad from Adam and Eve onwards and, and all of these kind of things. They a misunderstanding of God's nature and also God's creation. So there's this concept almost that God created. So, so far we've gone through two concepts. The concept that God created a flawed being such as Satan mm-hmm. who could become, you know, Fraud and leave well, yeah. God and yet never redeem itself is in itself an imperfect concept. Mm-hmm. And then this concept that God would create humanity flawed be- when they began is also an imperfect concept and certainly out of harmony with the truth about God. Mm-hmm. So, so there's two suppositions already uh, from this question yep. that are out of harmony with truth and logic. Gotcha. Right? So let's continue to the, to the fourth point. This gift of free will, the ability to make choices, is the key thing. It's a natural consequence of this gift that there is an infinite number of possibilities that are of choices that we could make. Yep. Now, that means that we have the ability to make so many fantastically, perfectly positive choices, yes. while at the same time, we have the ability to make, on the other hand, all these terrible, terrible negative choices. Yes. Right? Now... Usually the same ability isn't exercised in the same soul at the same time because usually if a person is in a very good development of love, they'll mostly or always make positive choices. And usually if the soul is not developed in love and has some misunderstandings, fears and other emotions about love, anger, rage and so forth, then the soul may make many very negative and evil choices. Mm -hmm. So they usually don't make good and evil choices at the same time because of the condition of the soul. But we are free will people. We we have the ability to make any choice we wish. This means, of course, that we have abilities to make evil choices. God gave us this ability. It's not an imperfect flaw. 
it's a design feature <laughs> in our soul. Mm, because inherent in the design is really teaching us about the difference, the, the consequences and the capacities of using our will in either direction. Yeah, the consequences and, and the joys of using our will. And we never, we, learn. we never lose the capacity to make good, choice. loving choices. Yeah. A different choice. And that's yeah. a perfect design, isn't it? Perfect yeah. choice. Perfect yeah. design. Yeah. And God makes perfect things. As a yes. person, as they grow towards God, begins to realise. Mm. So this concept of a limited God who created a limited being such as Satan, the devil, and created another limited being, the human being, and then, uh, and then had all these flaws in its creation, while at the same time the God itself being perfect <laughs> is a flawed concept. Yes. And it's also a concept that seems to prevail in much of Christianity, which, which is false. Yeah. You know, so we can't make these assumptions. Okay, so moving on. Now, since God knew that there was a possibility of us making all these different choices, you would naturally assume that God knew that there was a possibility we'd make a lot of bad ones. And there was a possibility we might make some good ones. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, does it not? Definitely. Now, God, in knowing this, then had to find a place where we could live if we had made bad choices and a place where we'd live if we made good ones. Mm -hmm. And so what God did was create another set of laws that create the location that mirrors the choice that we've made. Or the cumul cumulative uh, effect of all the choices we've made. It's not only the cumulative effect of all the choices we've made, it is also the individual choices we make create different locations. Great. Yeah. So, so, so in the end, we've had a life of choices, some good, some bad, some mm. good, some evil, let's call them. Yeah. When we pass into the spirit world, we have created a location that mirrors the choices we've made. Mm -hmm. Now, if through the choice of my life, I've, I've chosen through my life to exercise my will in a negative direction, I've chosen to murder a few people, go to war a few times, rape a few women and done a lot of other things like that, then when, by the time I pass, my, the location that I pass into will mirror the choices I've made. It will be a complete reflection to me of the choices that I've actually made. Mm -hmm. Now, that place isn't going to be a very pleasant place. It's probably going to be populated with other people who have made exactly the same choices. It's going to be populated with things around me that remind me of the choices that I made yeah. in order to correct those choices. That is a perfect system. Mm -hmm. So we create, through our choice, our own hell, which is a physical location and an emotional condition at the same time. We create through our choices. And it's not right to say that we would have chosen something different because many people, knowing good, still choose bad. So it's not right to say that they would have chosen a different location. Now, perhaps if they were aware that they were creating a location in which they would eventually live, they might have made a different choice. Mm -hmm. But most people on the planet, because of the lack of awareness on the planet, are not aware. And because they don't want to hear from the spirit world, there's plenty of people in the spirit world who want to tell you. Yeah. And, you know, like I said in the illustration of the rich man and Lazarus in the, that's recorded in the Bible, you know, the rich man wanted someone like Lazarus to go back and tell his family, look, if you keep doing these things, you'll end up where I am. And there's plenty of spirits in the spirit world who want to tell you that. Yeah. That if you keep doing these things, you'll end up where I am. But most people on, on earth have their hearing turned off to the spirit world. And in fact, the spirit world hearing is condemned by most religious face. And as a result, they can't hear these spirits saying, but, 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 don't do this, don't do this. If you keep doing this, you'll end up where I am and where I am is not nice, trust me. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what they want to say, mm -hmm. but, but they, they can't say it because they're not allowed, because the people on earth don't want to believe it and because the people on earth don't want to listen. So, so it's very important for us to understand that God did not need to create the physical locations it's, it's really the result of our choices interacting with the laws that God has already put in place. Exactly. All God so. needed to do is create the framework for the location to exist. Mm -hmm. And our choice would determine what location is created. This is a very powerful thing God has done, a very beautiful thing, in fact. God has created it so that every place we finish up living is the ideal place for a person in our condition to live. The hells 
are the ideal, most loving location to place a person who is killed or raped or, you know, done anything like that. The hills are the ideal. Any addiction we have, our addiction will be met in the location that we've created. Mm -hmm. That is the most loving thing for God to do, right? Until such a time as we're prepared, and when I say our addiction will be met, I mean the things that we've created will be reflected back to us in the creation through the location we've created, through our choice and decision. So, so these laws, which are like the framework of the creations that we make, we, we're making a heap of creations every single moment. Mm -hmm. right? So it's now, how can we then say that the hells need a Satan to exist? They don't. All they need is for me to exercise my will in an evil manner. That's how they exist. There's no other way for them to exist. Yeah. And the person was asking what sustains them. What sustains them is my will, isn't it? Is my it? will, yeah. my need for that place to exist because I created it through my will and my exercise of my will in an evil direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That place now needs to exist while I need to live there. Yeah. If I no longer needed to live there, that place no longer needed to exist. And this is the possibility, isn't it? As we it were talking is. about the design feature, we can always choose to change our will. Yes. Um, and, and therefore leave the hell that we had created. Exactly. So these and laws that God has made have created an infinite number of possibilities of existence, ranging from the most evil, which we would call the depths of the darkest hell, hell. Yeah. right the way through to the most bright, which is at the moment in the 36th dimension with, uh, with the soul union state at this point. That could be infinite progression in that direction. Theoretically, it might also be infinite progression in the negative direction, yeah. theoretically. Although in practice, what happens is the pain of such suffering gets so intense that a person doesn't want to go further. Yeah. And so eventually they stop yeah. and they feel satisfied with the hell they've created. And this is where I've feel that God's um, nature it shines through, doesn't it? Because And the way that she's created our universe in that it's all there designed to draw us closer to love and loving choices. But even in this giving us this free will, the, there's all these feedback mechanisms mm. which actually prevent us go going infinitely in the direction of darkness. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's very unlikely anybody would ever infinitely go in the direction of darkness. Mm. But I do feel quite strongly that there is the possibility of infinitely progression, infinite progression in the, in the direction of light, in yeah. the direction of love. So, so that's the beautiful thing God has done. Corrective system created by our own soul through the structure of the universal laws that God has made and the beautiful gift of free will that God has given us to see and me measure through our own feedback system where we are. And the system isn't based on our intellectual development. It's based completely on our passionate desires, whether they're exercised in harmony or out of harmony with love. Mm. And that's all that maintains the hills. The hells don't need to exist at all. If, an, if nobody ever exercised their will in the direction out of harmony with love, the hells would not exist. Right? But God had to create the potentiality of their existence. Otherwise, if we chose to do a negative thing, where we would live? <laughs> <laughs> so the potentiality of their existence had to be created through the law and the possibility of their existence and the actuality of their existence is created through our own action our own will, exercised in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we understand this infinite number of possibilities and the effect that it actually has on the human soul and therefore the human soul choices and then the infinite number of possibilities in terms of where we have to live as a result of those infinite possibilities of choices. Sure. Yep. The person in their question uh, says that the people themselves would not be capable of doing it, in other words, referring to the creation of the hells, or would not be motivated to want to do it for obvious reasons. I cannot agree with that statement at all. I see people today motivated completely on destruction, motivated completely on doing evil acts. Mm -hmm. Like God, by giving us free will, made our soul extremely powerful, made us capable of creating heavens and hells. And a lot of people are completely wanting to create hells. Yeah. They do. That they love living in the hells and they want to create the hells. Yeah. There are people on this planet and there are many millions and sometimes billions of them who want to create hellish conditions in which to live. 
They want a lack of morality. They want to be able to have the freedom to do any destructive thing they want to do. And, you know, it's like, it's like the, his statement here, I feel, is like saying to a, drunk, a person who's drunk and who's drinking, say, saying to them that, oh, you wouldn't want to drink because look at all the negative things it creates. Yeah. How many people want to drink even knowing the, the negative things it creates in their own life? How many people drink and, and they see their life disintegrating around them? They see their relations disintegrating. They see their, their relationship with their children, their parents, their loved ones all disintegrating. They see their monetary, monetary issues going down the gurgler economically. They see their whole life being destroyed. They see how their life is being wrecked and yet they still have another drink. Yeah. So I cannot agree that people wouldn't want to create such places for themselves. Now, it, I feel this question uh, is driven by a lack of understanding of people's desire for badness, mm. which is all driven through fear and rage and rebellion. And the reasons for fear and rage and rebellion all are about suppressed emotional conditions, generally from childhood. So, so I feel that the person in this question doesn't really understand the psyche of man, the psyche of humankind, yeah. in, in terms of what motivates our choices. So, so, like, many people have a huge motivation to create evil things in their lives. Yeah. And mostly it's rage and fear that determines these creations. But they have a, such a strong motivation that the only thing they can create is these things in their life. And you look at a person who, who, you know, is like Stalin and the people who supported him and Hitler and the people who supported him. Their primary motivations were towards destroying things in their life. Yeah. You know, and you can yeah. see that it must be driven by some pretty dark underlying emotions that they're in denial of to cause that particular thing to occur. So those kind of people have to create a hell in which to live. Otherwise, they have nowhere to live. Mm. Yeah. 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 So, like, in summary, I, I feel like God created this perfect framework in which all the possibilities of why our choices, based on our free will, could be made. We could make hundreds of millions of different possibilities. And then he gave this option to all humankind. So the billions and billions of people, of souls that he created all had ability to make completely different choices. Mm -hmm. So that means that there are billions and billions and billions of possibilities of locations in which a person can live. And God had to create a framework in which all of this could exist. Yeah. Very clever. Very clever if you Very think about clever. it. Very clever. And because we've just been, you've just been talking about the, the hellish conditions that are created, but the converse is true for every um, good decision. Um, there's a, there's a corresponding place as well. Yes. And as we grow in love, the potentialities expand for that also. Exactly. As we refine our love. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. it's an incredible thing that, that God has created, this beautiful ability to even develop your soul into a demonic state yeah. or to develop your soul into an angelic state and it be totally under your control, totally under the desire of your own will. Like that, that is an amazing gift that God has given us, this ability to, to make ourselves into anything we wish based on our will. Yeah. And I feel that once people understand this particular ability and the complexity of the framework of the laws that must exist in order for this ability to exist, then, God, then they will start understanding how powerful and great God is yeah. and how beautiful the system is. And also, um, would you say also about really the, the power of God's creation in us in that as a soul, we are so, we are so geared towards creation. Mm. We're, this person was saying we couldn't support the hells, but that's but actually can. underestimating the power, power of, of the soul. soul. Yeah. The soul, that's how much power we have in our soul we to have create. A, we have the power to choose a heap of evil acts which finish up creating a location that is so destructive and terrible that even we ourselves can't live there. Yeah. <laughs> Without, and, it, and be happy. <laughs> and it, the, the, our external creation almost compels us to change. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It reflects back to us the need for our change. Yeah. That's how much power we have. Yeah. We also have the power to do the opposite of that, to create such angelic locations that we can't imagine the beauty of them. We also have that power. God has given us this power in either direction. Yeah. And this is a beautiful thing that God has done. We, 
and in, it was just a beautiful gift that God has given us to sustain creation just through the use of our will. Yes, yeah. yeah. And if you consider that, then you can see that there is no need for a devil to even exist because we sustain the location of existence through our desire to live in such a location. For our desire to be evil creates a location in which we can be evil. Yeah. Our desire to be good will create a location in which our desire to be good is met. It just depends on our desire. This is the beauty of our free will choices. Now, God has made it so that if you desire to be evil, you've got a very small location. <laughs> so that that location cannot largely impact upon every single other being in the universe. Yes. And God's made it that if you desire to be good, you have very large locations in which you can exist. And, and God has made it this way so that if you desire to be good, you can have a great impact on the rest of the world and the rest of the existence and all the other people who exist. Yeah. Because you're acting in harmony with the principles of love that exist that create the framework of the universe. And under such a framework, what need is there for a devil? There is no need for a devil. It's a perfect system. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need some kind of flawed being who can't repent and who can't change and who can't get out of the point, uh, who can't be redeemed. And in fact, no such person can exist in this universe. The devil cannot exist in a perfect universe that God has created. Mm -hmm. Now, if I can conceive this perfect universe, then I'm very, very sure God can create it. <laughs> so even my imagination conceiving it means that it's a probable it's... part of creation. Yeah. And I'm saying it is also a certainty. I have observed this universe that I imagined at some point in my past did exist. I have now observed it in complete operation. So I can see its existence in complete operation, right from the depths of the hills, right the way through to what I have observed to be the pinnacle of mankind's current existence, mm -hmm. which I feel will improve even further after, after a time. So it's impossible for Satan the devil to exist in such a perfect system. Because Satan himself would just be someone who had been making uh, evil choices with his will and he could change that at any time. And exactly. He would be, yeah. And not only that, God has created this system which is redemptive. In yes. other words, the entire system has been created to redeem a person who makes a bad choice. Mm -hmm. Now, let's assume Satan is the worst of all people who have made all the bad choices that have ever been made. Yeah. He still has living in a universe that wants to redeem him. Yes. So and geared to redemption. And redeem. geared to redemption. Yeah. Yes. So it's impossible for Satan to actually exist permanently. Yeah. Now, there, there are many devils. There are many people who are like worse than the average conception on the planet of what a Satan would be mm -hmm. because of their exercise of their will, but they are all able to be redeemed. There is no permanent fixed pace for any of them. Mm. Yep. It's good. And, and there is no need for a Satan to maintain the evil. And in fact, the evil is just because of the choice of man. And it's a choice driven by fear underlying the choice. Yeah. It's the fear that generates the choice of rage and anger and rebellion and other emotions yeah. that cause the evil to exist. So I feel that the question you know, has many other things that we need to raise with it too. There's mm -hmm. another few other points that I feel we need to point. Yeah. When the last living person in the lowest condition of the soul is redeemed, mm -hmm. then into a new condition, they only need to be redeemed from from this point part here, which is uh, the lowest of the hell, into this new condition here. Yes. Then there is no need for that condition to ever exist. Well, in fact, doesn't it just simply cease to exist? It just simply ceases to exist yeah. because it's no longer maintained by any soul that created it. Yeah. So this is the beautiful thing too, and this is foretold in the Bible, that the hells will be rolled up like a book scroll. Mm. Right? And the reason why this will occur is because as soon as these people that are in the hells currently get into a condition where they've been redeemed, into a new condition of love, there is no longer any need for this hell to exist because there's no one who needs to live there. Yeah. And once there's no one who needs to live there, it no longer needs to exist. It can disappear. There is not the soul maintaining its location anymore. Mm -hmm. This is how powerful our soul is. Our soul creates the locations and is able to destroy them depending upon what 
choices we make. And, I, and I'm talking now about destroying the locations in the hells. The hells, the hellish locations will eventually all be destroyed. Not through any act of destruction, but just through the act of choosing to move our will in the direction of love. And once the and very last person moves their will... disintegrate, won't they? That's right. Once yeah. the very last person moves their will into the new condition, the hell will no longer exist because it no longer needs to exist. Such an exciting prospect. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why we've come, is yeah. to try and assist this process to happen a bit more rapidly than it's been <laughs> happening in the past. <laughs> yeah. The damage of the Bible teachings and holding on to the Christian teachings in themselves about the hells is that they tell the people that are in the hells that they can never get out of them. Yeah. Now, if you consider this, it's a very damaging teaching because what you're doing is you're telling a person they've created the hell, they're now living in the hell they've created, which is all true, but then you're telling them that they can't redeem themselves, that God hasn't made a perfect system that they could redeem themselves out of this condition. So you're telling them they can get in the condition, but they can't get out of it. Now that is a very, very damaging teaching very to tell damaging. somebody. Yeah. Because what you do is you then make them think, oh, if I can't get out of it, there's no point in trying. Yeah. And in some cases, it can make the person do even worse things because they, they feel that their life is hopeless. Here I am, I'm stuck with this, so I'm just going to do whatever I can to try and avoid this pain that I'm in, which usually is a fearful action, isn't it? Yes. So that usually means they take more and more damaging actions. actions towards themselves and other people. Exactly. Whereas if they knew the truth, they could say, okay, here I am. This is telling me my this will is... This is where I am. I'm in the yeah. hells, but I can get out. Yes. If I exercise my will in a different direction, I can get out. Yeah. Now, you imagine the power of somebody being told that. Other than being told, rather than being told, once you're there... You're there for good. Now, a person who's told you're there for good usually goes into further rebellion. Yeah. And that causes their condition to even go even darker and create another deeper hell even. So often these Christian teachings have created even darker hells through the teaching. If we teach them instead that any person who gets to any location in the spirit world can get out of that location through the exercise of their will in a loving direction, now every single person has the potential of getting out of their condition. Mm. And that's a beautiful, loving creation. Yeah. So there are, there are many other reasons why Satan can't logically exist. But as I've explained through this answer, there's quite a lot of logical reasons we've already presented as to yeah. why Satan cannot exist, why the hells do not need Satan to exist, to why a loving God would have created the potentiality of the hells existing and so forth. Yeah. So I feel that we've answered fairly uh, comprehensively the person's question about the possibilities of the hell's existence and, and also given in the answer the possibility of the hell's not being a future requirement depending on how mankind generally exercises their will. Yeah. So this is a beautiful... It's a hope thing. for the future, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. The, the hell's only need to exist why the human chooses unloving actions. Mm. The hell's no longer need to exist when the human stops choosing unloving actions. So, so the humans maintain the hell yeah. and there's no need for any other creature to maintain them and there is in fact no other creature that does maintain the hells. Mm. Mm. Great discussion. Thank you. Babe.